Warning. Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. In late April of 2011, a tornado outbreak struck Smithville, Mississippi. After hearing the alert, I walked outside. It was partly cloudy and warm, but it turned cool so quickly that I thought it was over, and I walked back inside my house. I lived in an apartment in a house with a double wall, a soundproof wall that separated my apartment from my neighbors. I was watching the news. WTVA chief meteorologist Matt Lobin said the storm was coming to Smithville and I just stood there watching, waiting, looking at the TV and thinking this isn't going to happen. About 30 seconds later, the power went out and the entire house shook for a minute, and then stopped. I thought it was over, so I was about to get up from my floor when the shaking began again, and wouldn't stop this time. I felt the pressure drop and as the shaking got louder, I got worried. Then it felt like the house exploded. I woke up one hour and a half later, in a field a quarter mile away from the house. I had cuts to my body and a deep cut to my head. I was covered in blood, dirt, and grass. I was taken to Tupelo, Mississippi, where I spent two weeks in recovery. Welcome back. Dark Recaps here. Before we continue, if you end up enjoying this video, I would appreciate you dropping a like to help me reach a wider audience. I would also be very grateful if you considered subscribing for more content like this. Let's begin. Amanda, Omaha, Nebraska, May 2008. Quote, When you live in Tornado Alley, it is drilled into your head what to look, feel, hear, and even smell for regarding a tornado. It was May 2008, around 1 or 2 a.m. I was living in a mobile home park in Omaha right up the street from Zarensky Lake, always had a killer view. My friends and I were sitting on our porch talking and having a wonderful time. I kept looking towards Zarensky Lake. I knew there was a storm coming, you could just feel it and smell the rain. It had been so humid that day, and as the storm grew closer it had dropped temperature fast. I look out and all I see is lightning. I didn't hear thunder at all. I say to my friends, I see lightning, but there is no thunder, no rain, no nothing. Usually you hear thunder. Next thing I knew, the breeze suddenly stopped and there was silence. No crickets, no frogs, no locusts calling out for mates. Nothing. I call my friends, and we get inside the trailer. As soon as we shut the door, we heard what sounded like a freight train. The entire home shook and we ducked and huddled together. The door flew open and I looked outside, while we were interlocking arms to make sure we stayed together. All I see is rain and what appears to be smoke swirling around. My friend's dad ran out from the bedroom and slammed the door and asked if we were alright. There were no sirens, no warnings, nothing. The mobile home stopped shaking. It was still so calm and then the siren started to go off. It was so faint to the point I thought I had lost my hearing. We turn on the TV to Channel 7 and we see Bill Ranby, chief meteorologist, who said that there was a confirmed tornado within city limits. It had touched down in Omaha, but the sirens were late and it had moved out of the park. We went outside and looked at our little community. There were no deaths, few were injured, but for being mobile homes, they were still holding up strong. Turned out the tornado did not touch down fully in the park, but still threw a carport into a neighboring car and tipped a tree, to the point you couldn't go up the road in any type of vehicle. I remember taking in a deep breath hugging my friend, and running over to my mom's house to make sure she was alright. To this day, I still remember that event and it still plays in my head. I now have two little girls to whom I am passing all the farmer tricks to, and teaching them to keep an eye in the sky and a foot in the tornado shelter in spring. End quote. 
Leary, Springfield, Massachusetts, 2011. Quote, It was early June of 2011 when a tornado touched down that would affect the lives of many and take the lives of three. Springfield, Massachusetts is a relative stranger to the ravages of these types of storms. Although severe summer storms occur, tornadoes are rarely experienced in our area. This particular day we had a NOAA tornado watch. Most thought that this was unlikely, but local authorities heeding this warning surely saved many lives. Schools had let out early and after school events were either postponed or canceled. At around 4, a tornado warning came over the television. This warning gave the precise location and direction of the sighted storm, and it was barreling towards our neighborhood. I told my wife we would be heading toward the basement when I made the call. She told me I was overreacting, but I took a stern tone and repeated what I had just said. Looking west, I could see the sky turning a greenish-brown hue, and all of a sudden the trees began to bend under the strain of the wind. I yelled, and we all went into the basement. As we hit the cellar floor, I heard a large thump that shook the house. Our next-door neighbor had a double trunk maple tree split in two and fall into her home. It was over in just a few minutes, and when things had subsided I went out back and saw insulation on the ground. I knew that buildings must have been damaged. We were fortunate. Thanks to the early warnings given by the National Weather Service and the response of the officials, very few injuries or fatalities occurred. If school had been in session, students would have been walking the streets and the loss of many more lives would have been likely. A woman was killed as she shielded her baby in a tub. Another was killed when her RV which was lifted and thrown at a campground. Another man was killed in his car by a falling tree. Fortunately, the only issues we had were loss of power for a few days and my children's school. Cathedral High School was destroyed. Thank you to those who work for the National Weather Service. Lives were saved that June afternoon, thanks to their dedication and pursuit of the understanding of weather. End quote. Francis, Parker, Colorado, 1983. Quote. It was spring, 1983. I was visiting my parents, seven miles southeast of Parker, Colorado, while my husband, USMC, was overseas. My baby was asleep in a west-facing bedroom. Mom and Dad had gone shopping, and I thought the storm clouds in the west looked like they might bring hail. I went out to cover the baby vegetable plants in my mother's garden, on the hillside about 100 yards south of the house. Every time I glanced at the storm I was alarmed by how much bigger it had become and how quickly it was approaching. With the last of the vegetables covered, I stood on the hillside wondering why there was so much noise coming from the entire western sky. Then I saw the reason for the buzzsaw noise. The storm was raging up the hill, from the southwest corner of my parents' five-acre lot, directly toward me. Its leading edge was as well-defined as a wall. The hail within it was chomping up the branches of shrub oak and ponderosa pine, mixing them with blasted up dirt and grass, and spewing them out like missiles. I ran for the house and my baby. As I tore into the house through the west door of the sun porch, and reflexively slammed the door closed behind me, the hail chewed into the screen door and the wood above me. Pulverized ice and torn screen from the door whooshed down on my heels and icy fog rebounded with a force that blew my hair straight up. As I tore through the porch, into the house and north, down the hall, the windows along the west wall exploded, one by one, to my left and just a fraction of a second behind me. I ran to my son, yanked him with a one-handed grab from his crib just an instant before the window exploded and wrapping him into my arms I scurried down to the basement and into the root cellar. The lights didn't work. As my eyes grew accustomed to the dark, I tried to see my baby's face clearly enough to look for injuries. None. I felt him all over, for glass. There wasn't any. Then I realized he was crying, 
probably shrieking, and I couldn't hear him over the noise of the storm, which was roaring wind, pounding hail and constant, overlapping blasts and rumbles of lightning. I'd never heard so much lightning, nor so much noise from a storm. It was deafening. I tried to soothe him, but then the house took a direct hit of lightning and suddenly I was frightened too. Afraid we might be burned alive if the house, above and beside us, burned. Together we huddled, terrified, and crying, and waiting. I didn't smell smoke. I told myself everything would be okay. Then just as suddenly as it had come, the noise was gone, except for a dull roar and the rumbling of lightning moving northeast, like the sound of a big truck with no muffler, driving away at two miles per hour. So I began to venture out from the root cellar. But as I stuck my head out the door to look into the basement, a fierce pounding began again, on the north wall of the house. So I held my son and soothed him there in the root cellar, as the pounding increased to a roar, coming from the entire house above us, and slowly diminished again. Once burned is twice learned. I stayed in the cellar waiting for the storm to circle back yet again. When I couldn't hear it anymore, I finally left the basement. I listened to the battery-operated radio, no report of storms. I called KOA News to find out whether more storms were expected. They hadn't seen any storms on their maps and clearly thought me demented. I called my brother who lived nearby. He and his family had taken shelter from the storm in a spec home he was building. They huddled in two groups, in the southwest and southeast corners of the building, and fearfully watched the 30-foot south wall of the home's family room stretching out between them, flex and wobble with the blast of the storm. It had held. They were okay. My parents came home. They had seen piles of hail and debris on the roads, but they hadn't seen the storm. My brother and his family headed for home and found that there was so much hail in the Pinery, a subdivision south of Parker, that snow plows had to be called out to remove the hail as cars and even pickup trucks like his couldn't get through. It was still 12 inches deep when the plows finally arrived. The shingles were nearly gone off my parents' house, the siding had been hammered and splintered, all the north and west windows were broken, and the screens ripped to shreds. Trees in their windbreak had no small branches or bark left, just bare wood, on the north and west sides of their trunks and larger branches. But my dad had built the house with three quarters inch plywood where only half an inch was required, and no hail penetrated it. Our neighbors to the north reported hail went through their roof and embedded in their hardwood floor. My car, parked outside, was bent and hammered mercilessly, yet all the glass survived while the rear end of the same neighbor's car was hammered only lightly, as it was inside their garage and the hail had only come in through the windows of the garage door, but both tail lights and the back window were broken out. Two weeks later, if I recall correctly, KOA, the local radio station, acknowledged with chagrin that they had missed the storm entirely. It had been so dense with hail that it showed up on radar as solid, just like the earth itself. It wasn't until one of their staff tried to make an unrelated insurance claim and was told that every available claims adjuster in the entire United States was busy with a natural disaster in Parker, Colorado, that KOA and the rest of the country became aware of the storm. End quote. Gary Allen, Coffee County, TN, October 2011. Quote. Living in Dixie Alley, we get lots of storms. In April 2011, we had already been hammered by tornadoes. We didn't get hit, but poor Alabama got wrecked. It was extremely odd to see paper debris from Alabama falling from the skies in TN. Even canned goods. In October of 2011, we had a tornado and massive hailstorm. Where I was working the hail was prominent but only pea-sized. I had never seen so much hail fall for so long. This went on for like 10 minutes. It was a rainstorm of hail and the wind was up. We were all just standing there watching it. It was close to quitting time. 
didn't do any damage to speak of. As I drove home, the closer I got, the worse things looked. Trees were completely stripped of their leaves. Cars were parked on the side of the road with busted windshields. My house is white. When I pulled in the driveway, my house was green. There was not an inch that hadn't been smattered with leaves. Even then, hailstones as big as a chicken egg were all over the yard and driveway. All the mailboxes had been sucked open and the mail was laying in the middle of the road. Power lines were down. My power line was ripped loose. The actual hail looked like it was grapefruit sized and went on just as long as the storm across town. About 10 minutes. I was very thankful that I had closed my swimming pool the weekend prior to that. Tons of debris in the cover. Things started to happen pretty quickly after that. My neighbor came running and wanted to know if I had damage. They had been sitting on their porch and saw the funnel and ran. No warnings were out that day. That's pretty common here. Storms pop up so quickly, you have to be a good watchful person. My cell phone rang, and my parents had been coming back to town right about where the storm began. They said they could see a black cloud approaching them fast, and then the hail hit. It busted out their windshields, and the car got picked up and thrown in a ditch. I went to go pick them up, and you couldn't even get back there from all the debris on the road, and the cops turning everybody away. Everybody in town had to have a new roof. Roofing companies from every state in the union set up temporary camps here in town. Adjusters set up tents in the mall parking lot for you to drive your car into to assess damage assembly line style. Roofing companies were going door to door. You don't notice things right away. It immediately turned winter cold after that storm, too cold to get out and look around. I had to have new roofing on the house and all the outbuildings. Then in the spring, when it finally got warm enough that you could actually go outside, that's when you notice the weird stuff. The screens were pulled up out of the frames in the windows. Some of the vinyl siding had holes. The dryer vent had been shattered. A plastic bucket full of sand for the swimming pool steps had been shattered. The kicker was taking the cover off the pool and the plastic side rails looked like Swiss cheese. The holes were all about two to four inches in diameter. Amazing. It took about two years or so to get all the roofing jobs done in town. With hail that large and coming down that hard it killed cattle. It just beat everything to smithereens. End quote. Scott, Bartlesville, Oklahoma. 1982. Quote, In the later part of March 1982, I was on spring break and home by myself that whole week. For three days before the tornado, it was incredibly windy but sunny out. My dog would just stand in the yard and howl for hours those entire three days, as well as acting off in other ways. As a side note I had never seen her act like that before or after that time period. On the evening of that third day, we were eating supper and starting cleanup when the tornado sirens went off. We all were surprised considering it was still sunny out. Mom turned on the radio and sure enough a tornado was on the ground, headed our way. Now in Oklahoma when I was a kid, if the sirens went off you went outside first to try and get a look before taking shelter. So we all went out front and encountered multiple neighbors and their children doing the same. It was almost like a block party with all the excitement. My best friend's dad was standing on his truck with a pair of binoculars, trying to see where it might be. To the west slash southwest it was pitch black moving towards us quickly, otherwise the sky was blue everywhere else. Suddenly my friend's dad turned with a look of absolute terror and started screaming, get inside, good God get inside now. He grabbed his little daughter under his arm and bolted to his house. I will never forget the look on his face and the fear in his voice. I was seven and knew it must be serious. We didn't have a basement, so we all got in the interior hallway with blankets and pillows on top of me mostly and waited. 
There was like a brief squall with wind slash heavy rain and then it got dead calm. I thought it was over but then my dad said, here it comes, get ready. Within a few seconds we could hear a low rumble getting progressively louder. It sounded more like a jet engine instead of the sound of a train approaching. As it went through our area, the entire house felt and sounded like it was in a wind tunnel slash sand blaster. I've never felt a house shake and shudder like that, and the sound of dirt, debris, whatever else raking the house was unearthly almost. During the worst of it, my parents, who weren't incredibly religious, started saying the Lord's Prayer and telling each other and me, I love you no matter what, over and over. To this day I tear up realizing they thought we might not make it that day. Finally it was over and we stepped outside to survey the scene. Apparently, the tornado was skipping through town rather than taking a continuous path and jumped right over my street, but destroyed houses and businesses just two to three blocks in either direction. Our street was littered with paper, siding, tree limbs, etc., but we sustained very minor damage overall. Two streets down though people were not so lucky. In the frenzy of taking cover, we forgot about my dog in the backyard. I flipped when she wasn't out there after the storm. We were calling her but got no response when suddenly she came out from under the shed, a concrete slab, all wet and muddy. She had burrowed under that concrete slab to take cover. She went on to live a good dog life and died of old age. End quote. Sherry, Bryan, Texas, 2019. Quote. In late April of 2019, I was in my shop at Coyote Run, Bryan, Texas, working on a Volkswagen engine. It had been raining hard most of the afternoon. At approximately 4.30 p.m. the rain stopped, and there was an eerie silence followed by the patter of what sounded like hail on the metal roof of the shop. Then the wind started howling, followed by a large crashing noise on the back wall of the shop. I looked up and saw the 16-foot garage door bowing inward from the wind. I thought, oh no, I hope it's not a tornado. The door breathed back out. I sighed a breath of relief, hoping the twister had skipped over the shop. That relief was short-lived as in the next few seconds, I heard the train sound, which actually sounded like a thrashing machine metal being chewed up, indescribable actually. Then the entire back wall of the shop began to bow in. All I could think of was getting to a low spot. There was none. My next thought was to get to an interior hall so I ran to the bathroom, laid down on the floor and grabbed the toilet, knowing it was bolted to the ground. In the next two to five seconds, I saw the corner of the shop and bathroom lift up and disappear over me. Then I was hit with a force I can't describe and felt myself being lifted into the air traveling backwards, at what seemed like 100 miles per hour. I was being hit from all directions by objects and beams from the building. A thousand thoughts went through my mind, and I just knew I was dead. I prayed for God to save me, then I was slammed back onto the ground. I realized I was alive and did not think I was hurt too badly. Then the debris started falling out of the sky. I thought, oh great, I survived being sucked up into the air in a tornado, now I'm gonna be crushed to death. As the debris fell onto me, I fought and pushed and shoved anything that landed on me trying to get whatever landed on me, off. Then as fast as it started it was over. No noise. I was bleeding and it felt like my ankle was broken, but I was alive. I couldn't breathe because I was being crushed. I pushed one more time and was able to create enough space to breathe. I hollered for someone to get the building off of me, but no one answered. I wiped the blood from my eyes and saw a 1965 Pontiac Catalina next to me. My first thought was why is that car in the bathroom with me? Then it hit me, I was some 80 feet from where the bathroom once stood and was out in the parking lot in front of the shop. I pushed and clawed my way out of the rubble, shocked, angry and thankful to God that I was alive. I survived bruising from head to toe with a broken foot and some lacerations. 
I went back out to the shop the next day and just cried, seeing where I had crawled out from the broken pieces of the toilet under where I laid. Turns out the toilet had just been set on the wax ring and caulked to the floor, not one bolt in the slab. In retrospect, that toilet not being secured is probably what saved me as I think I was traveling with the debris in the twister, not sitting still being struck by the debris field. End quote. Eric Simmons, May 2019, Little Rock, Arkansas. Quote. I was out on the back lot, what we call the backing pad, when it began to storm. So I told everybody as usual to take shelter until the lightning stopped. Some people went to their cars, some went inside. It was just a light rain and the lightning was in the distance, so I stayed in my pickup truck parked next to a fence with a large tree in front of me. There was also a metal carport to the left of me. Directly behind me, sitting perpendicularly to my pickup truck, was a semi-truck. The rain was light. My truck was running and I had the windshield wipers on. I looked out the driver's side window and noticed it was getting a little windy. Some of our camping chairs blew over. I looked out my right windshield and noticed the vines growing along the fence were starting to blow around kind of funny. A moment later, just like that, all around me was wind and it got real dark. The wind was going in a way that I've never seen before. Then a section of a roof blew over me and just shredded apart midair. That's when the back windshield on my pickup truck shattered, throwing glass all over me. The tree sitting directly in front of me, which was relatively large, blew over like it was nothing. Also, part of the fence blew over top of the hood of my pickup. I crouched down real low in the driver's seat and just prayed. I held onto the steering wheel for dear life. I could feel the back of the truck lifting. I could still see out the front windshield and I could see power lines exploding out in front of me. The visibility was really poor at this point, but I could still see the flashes. It lasted for about 45 seconds, but it seemed like a lifetime. I remember praying out loud and my hands were shaking. I had my phone in my hand so of course, even though I was freaking out and praying to God thinking that I probably wouldn't live, I decided to try to video what I could. I could see the semi that was behind me had blown over top of me and landed next to the carport. I could barely walk. I was in a state of shock, knee deep in flood water. I walked around more or less like a zombie, shaking and trembling, looking at the other two semis that had blown over. There were people running about in every direction. I don't know how long I wandered around. Some of my other instructor colleagues saw me and came up to me to ask me if I was okay. I couldn't even speak. Finally, I managed to phone my wife at work, but she couldn't pick up so I left a voicemail that she still has. I don't think I ever want to hear that because I do remember I was screaming. I don't know how long it took me to calm down and regain my senses, but I finally went back to record a video walkthrough of the damage. Then I went back to my pickup truck which was still running and started to pick up some of the debris and nails so I could drive out of there. I've been through a couple traumatic incidents in my life as a veteran of the Gulf War. This was, hands down, one of those most traumatic and terrifying moments of my life. I think the real reason why I was so terrified was because I had no training, no warning, and no defense against whatever was coming. The tornado was classified two days later as an EF-1 tornado. It had a base of about 75 to 100 yards across. End quote. All I can think of is shocking. Nobody in their lives should go through something so horrific, and for those of you who did, you have my utmost sympathy. Please take extra care of yourselves and each other. I cannot imagine the pain you must have endured, but I can only hope you can find some peace in knowing that your suffering has not been in vain and will be used to help others going through similar experiences. Have you ever experienced bad weather before? Let me know in the comments below. Please consider leaving a like on this video. If you got all the way to the end, 
I think you should subscribe to me. Dark Recaps. Thanks. Take care, and I'll see you guys next time.